I mean, Isaiah chapter 5. And last time we talked about how Isaiah is singing a song. He says, A song of my beloved touching his vineyard. We know that the beloved is the Lord, and the vineyard is the house of Israel, according to verse 7. And it talks about how the Lord hooked them up with a fruitful hill. He put a fence around it. He gathered out the stones. He planted it with the choicest vine. He put a tower in the midst of it. He made a wine press therein. He was looking for it to bring forth grapes. But instead, they brought forth wild grapes. They brought forth the wrong fruit. So as a consequence, he's going to take down the hedge. They're going to be eaten up. He's going to break down the wall. They're going to be trodden down. He's not going to prune or dig it anymore. And up, up is going to come the briars and the thorns. And now, in verse 8, he's going to get into the six woes declared against Israel. So he says, Woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field. You know, they're one on top of another. They say the worst crime happens in the big, big cities with people one on top of another. I just read an article the other day that Washington, D.C., getting so bad that people don't even want to walk around at night or get out at night. They're too afraid of what might happen. And you know, like the Lord said, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold, and the tribulation, we're already headed towards that way. You, it's, it's kind of scary to go out. It says, Woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field, till there be no place, that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. It's another thing, when you join house to house, you lay field to field to the point you can't even get alone anywhere. And it's not always good to be alone, but many times it is good to be alone. That way you can get alone and read the Bible, get alone with God and pray, get alone without any distractions. That's why it's best to get up early in the morning while everybody is asleep and get out your Bible and read and pray. No distractions, just you and God alone. But that's hard to do when you join house to house, when you lay field to field. And he, and he says, In mine ears, said the Lord of hosts, of a truth many houses shall be desolate. You know, they're laid waste, ruined, with nobody there, no inhabitants in it. Even great and fair, without inhabitant. You see, this house, these houses down here, <clears throat> One of these days, they're going to be unoccupied. The greatest house you know is one day going to be unoccupied with nobody in it. You're so concerned with your house, one of these days, you're not even going to be living in it. If time lasts, somebody else is going to be living in it that you probably don't even know about. And there are vacant houses. You can look it up. There's vacant houses, apartment buildings, even big mansions but they're unoccupied because of the horrible, maybe the horrible crime in places or just something else might have happened and they're just vacant, just sitting there. So you should reserve a better house. And in John 14, in John 14, or in verse 2, it says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So, you need to quit worrying so much about your house down here and focus more on a house you can have up there. Because many houses shall be desolate. That is... Laid waste, ruined, without inhabitant, even great and fair, without inhabitant. Big, nice houses with nobody in it. He says, Yea, ten acres of vineyard shall yield one bath, and the seed of an homer shall yield an ephah. And I looked it up, and a bath is eight gallons. And basically, this is saying. The vineyards and seeds are going to produce way less than what 10 acres of land is supposed to produce. 
Uh, a 10 acre vineyard would only then produce six gallons of wine when normally one acre would produce around a thousand gallons. So it's going to produce way less. The vineyards and seeds are going to produce way less as a consequence. You see, God's in control of all that stuff. You just think you're in control of stuff. God's the one in control. So he says, Woe unto them that join house to house. The next one he says, Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning that they may follow strong drink. You see, it's good to rise up early in the morning. Search that phrase throughout the Bible. You see that Abraham got up early in the morning when he went to sacrifice Isaac. You'll see that David got up early in the morning when he went to fight the giant. You'll find that Moses got up early in the morning when he got the Ten Commandments. But then you got people that rise up early in the morning and they follow strong drink. You see... God can use your dedication, then the devil can use your dedication. Some people are dedic so dedicated to the devil that they even rise up early for him. You don't want to rise up early in the morning and follow strong drink that continue until night to wine inflame them. That's a word that pops out, inflame. That's a good word for it because it will make you burn in your lust. And your pleasures like this will lead you away from God. And you'll find that every, just about every or any time you see somebody drinking wine in the Bible, something bad happens. For instance, Noah, back there in Genesis, he got drunk. It ended up with the first case of sodomy in the Bible. You got Lot and his two daughters. They got drunk. It ended up with two children by incest. And those children became two of God's people's biggest enemies in the Bible. And you got one of those kings over there getting drunk. He ends up dead because he's not alert to defend himself. You got David... Attempts to get Uriah drunk in, in order to cover up his sin with Bathsheba. So you see that strong drink over and over again. The Bible uh, is against it. Look at Proverbs 23, 29. Proverbs 23 and verse 29. It says, Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath redness? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? You see that babbling? You know, when somebody's drunk, they can't hardly talk plain. Wounds without cause, they fall, and it's just for no reason. They, and they bump their head. They got wounds. They don't even know where they came from. They got redness of eyes. And notice that who hath woe. Right there in Proverbs 23, 29, talking about a person who does strong drink, and then over here in Isaiah 5, it says, Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink. It goes on to say in Proverbs 23, 30, They who hath woe is those that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. Then he says, Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. He says, Don't look at it. You know, somebody says, you know, I don't touch this stuff. You're better off to just say, I don't even look upon this stuff. If you look, you may end up wanting to touch it. Because they can make it look good on the billboards. It make it look like it tastes good. And thankfully, God kept me from even drinking as a lost person. I've never, I've never drunk alcohol, but many times you look at it and you see it. Maybe you go into a restaurant and you, you saw it. Or you see it on a billboard, and it looks like it would taste good. And you look at the people drinking it, and they look fancy a lot of times. Maybe you go on a vacation, and it seems like when you go places on vacation, everywhere is people drinking. And it looks like people that are fancy, well-off, popular people. It's very deceptive. <clears throat> the devil makes you think that you'll be 
popular. You'll get a lot of women. You'll finally be happy. If you start doing things like tearing long at the wine, going to seek mixed wine. Then he says in Proverbs 23, 31, Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth this color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. It bites like a serpent. Who's the serpent? The same one that got Eve. The same one that got Noah. The same one that got Lot. It says, Thine eyes shall behold strange women. You end up going to bed with women that you never would have. And as it says, Thine heart shall utter perverse things. Yet thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. You just go right back to it. <clears throat> you give yourself over to it. You see, there's sins that you can give yourself over to. Alcohol is one of them, where you no longer control yourself. It's controlling you. Many people won't come to God because they think there's no freedom. But there's actually liberty in Jesus and freedom much more than you have in the way of a transgressor. Because the way of a transgressor and somebody that seeks strong drink is going to be in chains to that sin. They're going to want to seek it yet again, over and over. You know, Paul says, Be not drunk with wine, where is in excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit. Don't be drunk with wine. He tells the Ephesians that. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, a drunk's favorite verse is one in Timothy where he tells Timothy to use a little wine. In 1 Timothy 5.23, he says, Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. So, you see, first off, Timothy was sick. And he was going to use a little wine. So the first thing to ask somebody when they use this first is, well, are you sick? And another thing is, are you using a little? And mo mostly the answer to both of those is no. And then even at that, this wine here, every time that wine is mentioned in a good light, it's talking about new wine. And new wine in the Bible is grape juice. It's just grape juice, not fermented. And old wine, which is fermented in the Bible, that's, that's alcohol and that's what's condemned. So most likely Paul is telling him to use a little wine, new wine, not that's fermented. I'll show you some verses on that. In Isaiah 65, 8, it says, Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster. You see, that new wine is found in the cluster. It's just, you, you think about a cluster of grapes. It's just grape juice squeezed out of the grape. Let's look at another one. Proverbs 3.10. Proverbs 3 and verse 10. It says, So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. See, new wine, if, if that's alcoholic wine, it can't be. Because it says the presses are going to burst out with new wine. Showing you new wine is just grape juice. It's not fermented. It can't be fermented right off the presses. And so, most likely, Paul's telling Timothy to drink new wine for his stomach's sake. <clears throat> but there's there's verses people want to use to to help their drinking habit. But but over and over again, you see the Bible talking against it. Back in Isaiah five eleven, woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, not to read, not to pray, not to get alone with God. They've joined house to house. They're not about getting alone. And I'm not saying that you're not right with God because you got people living next to you. But 
Sometimes it's just good to be alone. You need to find ways to get alone. I rise up early in the morning and get along with God, not to follow strong drink and continue until night to wine and flame you and you're burning in your lust. He says, and the harp and the vial, this is Isaiah 5, 12, and the harp and the vial, the tabret and pipe and wine are in their feasts, but they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of his hands. You see, things that go along with alcohol, you'll find is music. So he's got the harp and the vial and the tabret and the pipe. And music, it's, it's usually associated with with big drinking parties. You see, you, at the beach or all these places, they got live music and alcohol. And here they got the harp. That's around four, like 46 strings. They got the vial. That's... A six-stringed instrument. They got the tabret. That's like a tambourine. They got a pipe. That's a wind instrument. And you see, the type of crowd that goes to parties, listens to wild music, they don't have their minds in the Lord's work. So it says they don't regard the work of the Lord. When you're constantly partying and listening to music and eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, you're not mindful of the work of the Lord. You don't have time to get alone with God. You're rising up early in the morning to have fun, strong drink, continuing until all night to wine and flame you. You're not considering the operation of his hands. And you think about that for us and thinking about the operation of his hands. Look at Colossians 2.11. It says, In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made Without hands, it's made by the Lord. This circumcision is the Lord's doing. And putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. You see that word operation. I link that back to this. People are so distracted with entertainment, strong drink, partying, music, they don't have time to regard the work of the Lord. They don't have time to think about salvation and the free gift of salvation. And they're not thinking about the spiritual circumcision of the Lord. Imagine you going up to somebody and saying, talking about the spiritual circumcision. One of the greatest truths in all the scripture. They're going to look at you like you're crazy, like you're a weirdo. And most uh, pastors don't even know about the spiritual circumcision. But that's an important thing. It's the operation of God. It's And people don't regard the work of the Lord. Neither do they consider the operation of His hands. They know all about the game operation. They've played that many times. They've spent, even though they never played it since they was a kid, they spent more time playing operation at the board game than they have spent reading the Bible their entire life. They may be rising up early in the morning. They may be very uh, devoted, hardworking people. But they're rising up early in the morning to do things that have nothing to do with God. They're not regarding the work of the Lord at all. It says, therefore, my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. And their honorable men are famished and their multitude dried up with thirst. They have no knowledge. You know why? Maybe because they joined house to house, one on top of another. They can't be placed alone in the midst of the earth. They never get alone with God. They're rising up early in the morning, but not to get quality time with the Lord. It's to do things like following strong drink. That's what they're worried about, getting that drink and that music. You know, you know all the, you hear that harp and the viol and the tabret and the pipe, and you know all the words to those songs. It's crazy, you can, even even me, I was big on music before I got saved. I can still say all the words to certain songs, and a lot of those songs, I can just do it word for word, even though I haven't heard them, and I've been saved around 13 years now, 
I can still say those songs word for word. Filthy songs. And <clears throat> you'll find people, they know all these songs. They don't know any of the word of the Lord. So, what you need to do is rise up early in the morning, but make sure it's to get quality alone time with God, not to follow strong drink, not to get into filthy stuff, not to follow the way of a transgressor, but get along with God. Isaiah goes on to say in verse 13, Therefore my people are gone into captivity. Notice verse 13. A neg negative in the Bible. Always negative, just about every time. The people have gone into captivity because why? Because they have no knowledge. Now, let's look at some verses to go along with that. Hebrew or Hosea 4 and verse 6. In Hosea 4... In verse 6, he says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. So he says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Now let's look at some New Testament verses about it. Second Timothy 3 and verse 7. 2 Timothy 3, 7. It says, Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So getting knowledge doesn't just come from studying all the time. You could be learning something every day, ever learning, and still not coming to the knowledge of the truth. So some people just aren't learning. Some people aren't trying to get close to God, get in the Word of God. And then you got some people who are ever learning. Maybe they are trying to get close to God in some way, but they're doing it in the wrong way. Let's look at another one. Philippians 1 and verse 9. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 9. It says, And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that you may, may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense to the day of Christ. See, when you get knowledge from the Scriptures, you get the judgments out of the Scriptures, you know how to approve things that are excellent. If you don't know how to approve things that are excellent, you're going to start approving things that are wicked. And that's what you're going to see in a minute that Israel does. They're not approving things that are excellent. They're improving things that are dark, and wicked. Now, let's look at another one. Colossians 1 and verse 9. Colossians 1 and verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So fill with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So this isn't something that's, that's just one place here and there. It's something that's all over. And it goes on to say that you might work worthy of the Lord and all pleasing. Be a fruitful and being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Increasing in the knowledge of God. And just like it says in 2 Peter 3.18, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. you got to be ever learning, but you got to come to the knowledge of the truth. you got to be looking at the right thing Get the real word of God. And you don't just you don't approach the real word of God with a critical, skeptical spirit. When I open the Bible, I don't say, um, I don't say, well, this word should really be this. I don't say, well, I doubt that this has been translated correctly. I don't say all that. I approach it and just 
believe it. I don't correct the Bible. I let the Bible correct me. So, Paul says, in, in Thessalonians, he says, it effectually worketh in you that believe. If you don't believe the Bible, it's not going to effectually work in you. And you're not going to get no knowledge. You're going to be ever learning, but you're not going to get no knowledge. That's going to help you anyway. So he says back there in Isaiah 5, 13, Therefore my people are going to captivity because they have no knowledge. They've not learned what they're supposed to learn. They've not found out how to approve things that are excellent. So it says, and their honorable men are famished. Even the, the honorable men that ought to know a little something are famished. That means they're starved to death. And all the honorable people you see today around here are famished. They have, they have absolutely no appetite for the Word of God. They don't care about the Word of God. If they do read the Bible, they don't believe it. If they do read the Bible, they contradict themselves. They say it's the infallible, inspired, inerrant Word of God, but they still believe it's got errors in it. And they they use multiple versions of the Bible. They say that there's no perfect. There's no. They say there's no perfect translation. So they do believe it's got errors. So they're lying. It doesn't effectually work in them because they don't believe it. They may have a lot of learning. They're ever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And they're famished. And their multitude dried up with thirst. Now look what it says in verse 14. Isaiah five fourteen, It says, Therefore hell hath enlarged herself. And open her mouth without measure, and their glory, and their multitude, and their pomp, and he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. Now hell, the Bible says in Proverbs twenty-seven twenty, hell is never full. <coughs> it says hell is never full, and the eyes of man are never satisfied. <coughs> All throughout the Bible, you see. People believing in hell, preaching on hell, teaching on hell. It showed up way back there in Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy 32, 22. Deuteronomy 32 and verse 22. It says, For a fire is kindled in mine anger, and shall burn unto the lowest hell, and shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. Hell is where the anger of God is kindled at. That's a place where God's anger, his wrath is satisfied. And it says it's enlarged herself. So I guess it, it gets gets bigger and bigger. Because you always got so many people going to hell every day. It just has to get bigger and bigger. It's never full, it says. It's in, it enlarges itself. You can't. You'd think, you know, a place like that, all the souls, billions of people, billions of souls that's went down there, it'd be full. But it says hell is never full, Proverbs twenty seven twenty. I guess that's because it enlarges itself. And open her mouth. It's like a monster down there. Just open its mouth, waiting for the next sinner to die. And their glory and their multitude and their pomp, and he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. You see, if you don't get saved, when you die, your soul is going to descend down into hell, just like the rich man. He said the rich man also died and was buried. That's his body. But then it says that in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torments. So that's his soul. And your soul is going to descend down into it. And... You know what? The Lord Jesus Christ, he descended down for you so that you wouldn't have to. Jesus descended down so that you wouldn't have to go to hell. He took your hell on the cross, and for three days and three nights, he went down to the heart of the earth, 
but his soul was not left in hell. He rose again. Jesus took your hell on the cross. You don't have to go. That's the only good thing about hell is you don't have to go. It says in verse 15, And the mean man shall be brought down, and the mighty man shall be humbled, and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. The mean man, that's the little good-for-nothing man, he's going to be brought down. The mighty man, he's going to be humbled. You know, there's a lot of mighty men who their confidence is in their self. Their confidence is in the things of the world. They're going to be humbled. And the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. If you're lofty, you know, you just got your face stuck up in the air. You're thinking you're all that. Lofty is like you're, you're elevated in place. You're, you're just so high. You're like a lofty mountain thinking you're way up there. But there's only one true lofty one. And that's Isaiah 57. Thus saith the high and lofty one, capital O, that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. He's the only lo real lofty one. These other people just think that they're, that they're high up. But... This puts you, when you read about this, they're going to be brought down, the mighty man humbled. That reminds me of Revelation 6, where it's talking about the second coming. And the people, and when Jesus Christ comes back with all his saints, these people are going to be humbled. They're going to be brought down. And they're going to set up the kingdom. In Isaiah 5 16, it says, But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment, and God that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. It's going to be the Lord that's exalted one day, only Him. Then it says, Then shall the lambs feed after their manner, and the waste places of the fat ones shall strangers eat. And then he's going to get into the next one. Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity, and sin as it were with a cart rope. So this next woe has to do with these people that are sinning so much. It's like they're carrying around sin by the cartloads. It says, Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin as it were with a cart rope. It's like they've got so much sin, they got something carrying it, pulling it behind their back. Proverbs 5.22 His own iniquity shall take the wicked himself and he shall be holden with the cords of his sins. He's got the cord of sin just wrapped around him and he's pulling a huge cartload of it behind him. This shows you a progress of sin too. Starts out with cords then it gets on a cart and then a, ro a, a cart rope, and then you're in chains to it. You're just chained up by it. The pleasures of sin are the last for a season. First you think you're in control, then it controls you. First you think you've got it you know, tied up, then it's got you tied up. Then it says in verse 19, that say, let him make speed and hasten his work. This is what the enemies are saying. They're saying, let him make speed and hasten his work that we may see it. And let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw nigh and come that we may know it. These are scoffers here. These are big time scoffers here. They don't believe judgment is really coming. You see this over in Peter, 2 Peter 3. 3 through 4, it says, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. They said, Where's the promise of his coming? 
I've been told all my life that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming. Where's he at? Enoch back there was talking about it in Genesis, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with <clears throat> ten thousands of his saints. Where's he at? That's what they say. Isaiah 5, 19, that say, Let him make speed and hasten his work, that we may see it. See, they think they got to see it to believe it. And let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw nigh and come that we may know it. They think he's bluffing. They think the prophets are bluffing. They want it to happen speedily. So they say, let it make speed. You know what that reminds me of? It reminds me of Ecclesiastes 8 and verse 11. Ecclesiastes 8 and verse 11, it says, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. What that means is, because sentence against an evil work start executed speedily. You know, you go around doing bad things, you keep getting away with it. You get away with it for years and years and years. And because judgment doesn't come on you right away, maybe not the first year, maybe not the second year, maybe not the third year, you think, well, I'm getting away with it. And then your heart is just fully set in you to do evil. But then, finally, judgment comes. Kind of reminds me of a lot of these uh, serial killers, too. You think about the Golden State Killer. He got away with it for 30-something years. Was killing people, robbing people, raping people back in the 70s and 80s. Didn't get caught till like 2016, 17, 18. So it was like 30 or 40 years just going around killing people. He probably thought, well, I'm getting away with it. Got cocky with it. And so the his heart was fully set in him to do evil. And he's thinking, since judgment isn't coming speedily, I'm getting away with it. You know, a lot of times you think, I've been doing this for years. I'm getting away with it. You think about that serial killer, BTK. What did he do? Was killing people in the 70s, in the 80s. He ended up getting away with it for 30-something years. Finally gets caught. You're going to get caught. You may, you may have been doing it for a long time now. You're going to be caught. You, your secret sins are going to be out there. You might as well go ahead and stop now and pray God that he'll have mercy on you. Don't be saying, you know, don't don't be calling him out saying, bring it if you can do it. Don't be talking like the scoffers. It says, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. Therefore, the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. You know, I think God uses it as a judgment on somebody to not put them in check for their sin. Like, if you're getting put in check for every time you sin, consider that a blessing. Consider that as something good. Because when, you do, when God doesn't put you in check for your sin and just let you continue in sin without getting chastised, then <clears throat> you're just going to keep doing it. Honestly, and see, just because I, I think he'll chastise a, a, a safe person for so long, and if they're too tough for their own good and keep doing it, uh, I think you can get to a point where he doesn't chastise you no more, and you'll keep doing it, and then there's a sin unto death. You just do it till you die. So, Isaiah five nineteen. That say, let him make speed and hasten his work, 
that we may see it. And let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw nigh and come that we may know it. So just because you think you're getting away with something, because judgment hasn't came on you yet, mark it down, it's coming. And you got to remember, God is eternal. God doesn't see time the way you see it. In his eyes, you've not even been doing it very long. Because one day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. He's patient. He's long-suffering. You know, you maybe you started that sin you're doing 40 years ago. To him, that was a few minutes ago. So it's not being executed speedily to you, maybe. But to God, it's you've not been even doing it very long. And he's going to make you pay for it in some way. In the flesh. If you're, if you're saved, you're going to pay for it in the flesh. You'll pay for it by not getting rewards in the judgment seat of Christ. But you will pay for it. Don't be like these people, these scoffers that say, let him make speed and hasten his work that we may see it. Those are like the scoffers of Second Peter 3, 3-4. through 4. 